Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, in our Battleship Comparison series, we're going to be talking about the North Carolina class, comprised of North Carolina and Washington, BBs 55 and 56. These were the first battleships the United States built following the Washington and London Naval Treaties, and they are restricted by those treaties. So, spoiler, Battleship New Jersey, because she is larger, is more powerful than the North Carolina class battleships. The question becomes, for the 10,000 extra tons you pay to get an Iowa class battleship, uh, is it worth the expenditure? Like, or is she drastically more powerful? If you're interested in this question, also check out our previous video on the South Dakota class video, uh, battleships, which are a slight improvement over the North Carolinas in the same displacement, and are also built 10,000 tons smaller than the Iowas. So, uh, as you know, Battleship New Jersey is 887 foot, seven inches long. The North Carolina battleships were a little over 728 feet long. So 160 or so feet shorter. Uh, both battleships are about 108 feet wide to fit through the Panama Canal. Uh, and the North Carolina draws about 33 feet of water fully loaded, uh, which is about five feet shallower than New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey is just the heavier ship. North Carolina was designed to be 35,000 tons. With all the wartime additions and under her full load, she would get close to 45,000 tons. New Jersey was designed from the outset to be 45,000 tons uh, and would grow to be a little over 57,000 tons when fully loaded. All of the fast battleships had the same secondary battery, 10 twin mounts, 5-inch, 38 caliber guns. This was probably the best secondary battery of any ship during World War II and one of the best anti-aircraft weapons uh, so, all the ships compare very favorably to each other, obviously. North Carolina was originally outfitted with quadruple 1.1 inch anti aircraft guns, like many American battleships of that time. Uh, this gun proved to be relatively ineffective, and after the first couple battles of the war, it was phased out by these quad 40s. North Carolina was originally outfitted with 10 of these quadruple mounts, but by the end of her service, she had 15 of these mounts. New Jersey, while she was designed to have the 1.1 inch gun, had them replaced before she was finished construction with 16 of these quad 40s, and by the end of the war, she had 20 mounts on board. North Carolina's original battle battery of 50 caliber machine guns, uh, which again was standard in the opening weeks of the war, were switched out with 20 millimeter guns. And by the end of the war, she had as many as 60 of them on board. While she carried less quad 40s than the longer Iowa class battleships, she had more 20 millimeter guns, about uh, one third more. Armor is a place where these two classes of ships are very different. The North Carolinas were designed in the age of the Second London Naval Treaty, 1936. And in this treaty, there was a push to limit the caliber of battleship guns to 14 inches. North Carolina was designed so that she could either be armed with quadruple 14 inch guns or in the event that that treaty was not ratified by all powers, that they could be swapped out with a triple 16-inch gun. Uh, and she did get a couple of design alterations during this time period. Originally, she wasn't going to have as many 5-inch guns, so her twin mounts were, sec were uh, single mounts. And originally, she was going to have a single funnel with all of her uptakes trunked together. And in the end, they gave her two funnels, much like the Isles. Uh, as it turned out, the Japanese 
did not sign the second London Naval Treaty, so the calls about 14-inch guns was dropped out. Luckily, the U.S. Navy had planned for that, was able to put the more powerful 16-inch gun in. However, they had already designed and placed orders for the ship's armor. And the ships were still limited to 35,000 tons, so they couldn't add more armor to the design. So while the Iowas were designed to stop a 16-inch projectile, the North Carolinas were only armored against 14-inch projectiles. Unlike earlier fast battleships, or unlike earlier American battleships, the fast battleships uh, placed armor lowest in the ranking of firepower, armor, and speed. The, the United States deduced that being able to get to the fight was the big thing, and once you start taking hits, it doesn't matter how thick your armor is, your fire control, your command and control spaces are unarmored, so after a couple of hits, regardless of how much armor you have, you're not going to be an effective fighting unit. So have really good fire control and really good long-range guns so you can hit the enemy first. Uh, and have good speed so you can choose where you're fighting your battle. Make sure your battleships are there. Uh, and this ended up being successful for the United States. We didn't lose any of our fast battleships, and our enemies ended the war functionally without navies. Uh, in terms of armor thickness, the Iowas are just a little bit thicker in a couple of areas. Uh, the major difference in the armor thickness between these two vessels, North Carolina has an external belt. It's about 12 inches thick, it's angled at about 15 degrees, but it's external, which means enemy projectiles don't hit anything before they hit the belt armor. Uh, which means if the belt armor gets hit, it's really easy to fix. You can just remove that plate and slap a new one in there. The Iowas, have a 12.2 inch thick belt angled at 19 degrees to give them a little bit more equivalent thickness. However, it's internal. There are at least two other layers of steel between the outside of the ship and the armored belt. This serves to decap armor piercing projectiles on the way in so that by the time they hit the main armored belt, they don't have as much punch. However, it means if any of these ships had been damaged by enemy shell fire, it would have been far more difficult to have to cut open several layers of the ship to get to the armored belt. Uh, as it turns out, neither the North Carolinas nor the Iowas were ever significantly damaged by enemy shell fire. The one place where these ships did take damage in their torpedo defense. North Carolina took a torpedo in 1942 near the uh, Tur-1 magazines. Uh, both ships had very similar five-layer torpedo defenses, and uh, the United States calculated this was going to be a very good defensive system. They didn't really test it much, uh, and they were testing it against their own warheads. If we're building torpedo warheads with and size charge, then probably our enemies are doing the same. Not true. The Japanese uh, invested heavily in torpedo design and development and had a much larger warhead. So when this submarine launched torpedo hit North Carolina, it almost defeated the torpedo defense system at its weakest point near the magazines. Uh, and that caused the Navy's general board to look into increasing the torpedo defense in later American battleships. As it turns out, they were all rushed into the war, uh, and this was never accomplished, and, and not everybody agreed with that, because to increase the torpedo defense, one, now the ship won't fit through the Panama Canal, and two, you're losing a couple knots of speed. And remember, these fast battleships are trying to prioritize speed. Engineering was the major difference between the North Carolina class and the Iowa class. Each ship's propulsion plant was eight boilers, made by Badcox and Wilcox, like these behind me. Uh, and each one had four steam turbines 
powering four propellers. The North Carolinas were capable of a speed of about 28 knots, while the Iowas were capable of 33 knots. The Iowas had better internal subdivision. The North Carolinas and later South Dakotas, in order to save weight, had all of their engineering equipment uh, for each propeller in a single main space. So they had four main spaces, each with turbo generators for electrical power, turbines for propulsive power, boilers and condensers for creating steam, all in one space. The Iowas got extra subdivision so that she has separate fire rooms with boilers in them and separate engine rooms with turbines, turbo generators, and condensers. This means if a hit occurs on a bulkhead between the two spaces, uh, only a quarter of the engineering plant is flooding as opposed to half of an engineering plant with the older battleships. Now, five knots extra speed from the propulsion plant uh, seems like not much gain given the price of 10,000 tons to get this. So not only do you have to add more powerful engineering equipment, you have to lengthen the ship by what we said earlier, 140 some feet. You've got to then armor that additional length of the ship. Uh, and because you've got more ship now, you've got room for more aircraft guns, which means more people, which means more weight. So was it worth it? I'd say yes, it was. The Iowas were retained in service after the war purely because they had the same speed as the aircraft carriers. The older North Carolinas and South Dakotas, which could only make 27 or 28 knots, about five knots slower than the aircraft carriers, were decommissioned shortly after the war and were never brought back. Although, I will say, the South Dakota-class battleships, although an improvement over the North Carolina design, were much more condensed and cramped, so they were actually decommissioned first, uh, and the North Carolinas were retained a little bit longer because they had better living conditions. Uh, but in the end, neither of those classes of ships were ever brought back after uh, World War II, while the Iowas were brought back in Korea, Vietnam, and the 1980s. North Carolina set the precedent for modern American battleships, while the older standard type battleships always had two superimposed turrets forward and another pair aft, modern battleships with their limited displacements couldn't do that. So you get the two forward turrets with turret two superimposed over turret one and another turret back aft. All American battleships that succeeded North Carolina that were actually built had this arrangement. The guns for all of these ships were 16 inches, but for the North Carolina and South Dakota class, they were the slightly lighter 16 inch 45 caliber, as opposed to the 16 inch 50 caliber found on the Iowa class battleships. The higher caliber gave the Iowas a higher velocity, which gave them a flatter shell trajectory and a longer range. This is great for punching a shell into the side of an enemy ship. Uh, it's less great for plunging fire. The older American battleships like North Carolina, with the lower velocity shells, could lob shells through the thinner deck armor of enemy ships. It just took those shells a really long time to get there. But it's okay, because all of these battleships used the Mark 8 fire control computer, which was very accurate at plotting firing solutions, so they could accurately hit targets even with really high hang times. North Carolina and Washington both had active wartime careers. Uh, both ships had finished construction and were working up or already in full commission on the U.S. East Coast at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. North Carolina was able to quickly transition through uh, the Panama Canal and make it to Pearl Harbor, and she was the first modern battleship uh, to enter Pearl Harbor. She rapidly earned the nickname of the Showboat, as the new modern battleship. 
she got a lot of publicity. Uh, Washington followed soon after, and these two ships participated in a lot of the early fighting, uh, especially around the Solomon Islands. By the end of the war, North Carolina would earn 15 battle stars, more than any other battleship for World War II service. Washington was close behind with 13 battle stars. Notable service for the two ships, like we said, the Solomon Islands campaign, North Carolina was damaged by a torpedo, Washington was able to join South Dakota in the nighttime actions around Guadalcanal, and uh, she and four destroyers were able to engage the Japanese battle cruiser Karishima uh, and some heavy cruisers and other escorting ships around uh, Iron Bottom Sound. The Japanese ships spotted the American destroyers first and made relatively quick order of, out of them. Next, they spotted South Dakota and were able to pour a tremendous amount of fire into her superstructure. She had some electrical and internal communications issues and quickly dropped out of the fight. However, they had not spotted Washington, who was the flagship of Admiral Willis Lee. Willis Lee was perhaps the greatest gunnery officer of the war. He was an Olympic marksman with the Colt 1911 uh, and also an expert on 16-inch gunnery and radar fire control. So he ran the gamut from everything from a 45 caliber pistol uh, up to a 16-inch 45 caliber gun. The Japanese didn't even know Washington was there in the darkness, and at almost point-blank range, she opened up on Karishima, and using the radar fire control, was able to put several salvos into her without any response. Her 5-inch guns also poured into the Japanese ship's superstructure and destroyed their ability to coordinate damage control or further uh, orders. Fortunately for the American ships, which were now without destroyer escort, this rapid and aggressive destruction of a Japanese battleship forced the rest of the Japanese fleet to return. Uh, to leave the battle area. It's good for them because the Japanese heavy cruisers with their long lance torpedoes could have done significant damage to the unprotected American battleships, especially with South Dakota temporarily out of action. Another uh, incident involving the ships was in February of 1944 when the battleship Washington was operating in formation with the battleship Indiana, another South Dakota-class battleship. Indiana was ordered out of formation uh, to refuel a couple of destroyers in the middle of the night. Her radio room followed procedures and said that they were going to turn out of formation to the left uh, and reduce speed from 19 knots to 15 knots. Her captain, however, used what's been termed a seaman's eye to determine that a turn to the right would be better. Uh, but as he did this in darkness, Washington was coming up at 19 knots behind him and believing that Indiana was going one way because that's what had been communicated, he had turned the other way. So Washington ended up colliding with Indiana and uh, scraping up the back third of the ship, essentially. Removed an aircraft catapult, damaged the after-fire control tower, uh, knocked out some anti-aircraft guns, and knocked a big hole above the waterline uh, all down that uh, starboard side of the ship. Indiana went back to Pearl Harbor and was repaired relatively quickly. Washington, on the other hand, lost 60 feet of her bow, it was crushed when she hit the armored belt of Indiana. Uh, she had to go all the way back to Puget Sound, uh, and it took three months to fabricate a brand new bow for her. Otherwise, both ships made it to the end of the war. Uh, they did some training duties for a couple years after the war, were decommissioned. North Carolina was turned into a museum, uh, one of the first museum ships in the world. Washington, however, was not saved and was scrapped. Uh, North Carolina is currently a museum in her home state. Look her up. 
she is still very close to her World War II configuration. When you come and visit New Jersey, you're seeing the ship as she would have appeared in 1991. When you visit North Carolina, you're seeing her as she would have appeared around 1947. So things like the aircraft catapults have been removed, but most of the rest of the ship is intact to a World War II configuration, right down to the World War II camouflage scheme. I've been on board a number of times, and I highly recommend the tour uh, if you're ever in the area. Well, thanks for watching. We made today's video based on feedback from previous videos. A lot of people wanted to hear about North Carolina and Washington. So, if you've got another ship you would like us to compare to New Jersey, drop a comment down below. If you have any questions about this video or other stuff, let us know. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to hear about new content we're putting out. Uh, and if you would like to support the museum and the channel, check out the donate button in the description down below for ways to support us.